Four players are by Barstool Sports and brought to you by always is our very good friends, by our very good friends at Owens Mixers. They make phenomenal cocktails. They make the best mixers in the world. You pour it in with your favorite liquor, boom, you have an awesome cocktail. Transfusion, Paloma, you know the deal, but Owens Mixers, their uh, mint cucumber limes, probably my favorite outside the transfusion. Grapefruit and lime, loved by many others who make Palomas. It's awesome. OwensMixers.com, all kinds of good stores, Publix, etc. We are on the 18th green at Torrey Pines, and I will say conservatively, and if you are... Um, under 18, maybe under 13, cover your ears. But I would say that Tory Pines just ripped each one of our dicks off, curled it up into maybe a little ball, and then shoved it down our throats. Yes. <laughs> that's that, a good way to describe what happened. I don't know where we were going, happened. but I think that was pretty goddamn accurate. Have okay. we ever done a podcast standing up like this? We are recording <laughs> audio as just a couple guys talking. You know, we're standing on the 18th apron. Of the, of right, the we're green. not technically yeah. right on the green yet. I think at some point we're going to walk We're going to go there. meander our way onto the green. We got 18th green at 9 duh, by the spring course. Yeah, so, um, you know, we're just standing here with our hands in our pockets. We got lavs on. I didn't know what to do with my hands. We're looking at each other. Um, I'm actually trying to make as little amount of eye contact as possible with you guys because we're so goddamn close. I can do it with <laughs> you, but you, it's weird. <laughs> it's super <laughs> weird. Really You're close. right next yeah. to Yeah. We're just a couple guys standing around a golf course talking about a podcast. It actually feels like the most natural speaking that we've ever had. Because we do this after rounds anyway. We talk. We just played Torrey Pines South from 7,800 yards. Ugh. And now we're just talking about our round. We just happen to be mic'd up, and we have hundreds of thousands of people listening to us. True. It's true. <laughs> uh, i got to say, we have Brian Trottier on this show, who is uh, a four-time Stanley Cup champ, Islander legend, Hall of Famer. Seven-time Stanley Cup champion. Four times as a player. Four times as a player. Uh, six times as a player, one time with the Avalanche. Six as a player? Yes, he went from the Islanders to the Penguins and won two of them. Jesus, this Mario guy. And, yeah. So there's a lot of interesting tidbits here. He is, I looked up too, there's one of the top 100 NHL players of all time. Hall of Fame. Um, you know, he's. this was probably one of the highest moments of my career. Like, just being, being it, it's all-encompassing for me, right? Huge Islander fan. My dad is the biggest Brian Trottier fan ever. We have, we now have a military <laughs> this plane is great. flying over. It's a helicopter. We're Thank right you for next, your service. We're it's right very next. funny that we didn't think about that at all when trying to right set this up. To the San Diego <laughs> station for the United States Air Force and Navy. It's just the loudest vehicle. Woo! Helicopter vessel. Are we picking that up in the audio? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it goes it's the loudest. Going, yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, I mean, we just have to wait for that guy to fly over. When we were out here filming for Behind the Greens a couple like months ago, the guy was saying like this place is just impossible to hold a conversation. Yeah. Because especially during the day, because like you'll be talking, and then you all just have to awkwardly stare at each other for like five to ten seconds while these military planes are flying over these like Air Force planes because you just can't hear anything. You can't even hear your own thoughts. I said to Trent today one time, I said, you know, said, Trent, is your ball by that tree? And then it was right one of these things. I go, is your ball by the tree? <laughs> you just like, screamed I don't know. back at me. I just don't know. Yeah. But it's interesting. So this was, uh, this interview too was very interesting because I could not make it. And we sent, you know, our, um, our Larry King and Walter Cronkite of the group. The A squad. <laughs> to interview. Dude, I, 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 I like tucked my pee pee in between my legs and I said, we just gotta do it, you know? Yeah. I was a little bit nervous and I was like, we just, I don't even know if that's the correct saying of what I just said. I don't think like, that is the saying. Your legs. It was actually That's the usually kind of when you run away. Yeah, yeah. it's Tuck your opposite. tail between your tail legs. Tail between your legs. Not your pee pee. Pee pee between your legs would be when you're doing like a bit That's with like, the boys. Yeah. In your tail. You know, well, I was going to say, look like, at like you it's know, a I, vagina. Really, sometime. what it was is like I idea? put my oh, cock yeah. on the yeah. table, is what I was going to say. And I didn't okay. want, I, and I wanted to be a little bit more friendly to like the, you know. It's a kid show. I think I think it went I think it went pretty we well. We did too. start the show by talking about ripping our dicks off. I didn't want to do throat. the interview alone, so I had Trent come on there because I was nervous. I'm going to be very honest with the listeners. I was yeah. super nervous about conducting an interview with a Islanders legend. The guy you are an Islanders fan, right? I am a diehard Islanders fan. For anyone who doesn't know, they are they are falling right now. They have they're not really winning that many games. We're we're limping into the playoffs. It is what it is. Brian Trottier, his number has been up in the rafters. His name's been up in the rafters at the Nassau Coliseum. It's something that I've always seen. Nice from the Trottier, Trottier to Bossy. I've watched YouTube videos. My dad's told me the golden days, the glory days. So I was nervous, but it went fucking fantastic. The guy is a character. He talks about uh, the toughest players he's ever played against, winning four cups, Long Island, Borelli's. We go into it. Um, and it was fucking awesome, man. We recorded this about a week ago. Yeah. And uh, I'm really excited for people to come, you know, listen to it and hear it. So that's part of the show, and uh, it's like 50 interview. minutes. People are, it's, it's your first interview. Yeah. First, you guys did 
together meant a lot to Frankie. And I'm excited. I'm genuinely excited to listen. A hockey guy and Matt seven times Stanley Cup. Is that what it is? Seven times. Yeah, Stanley I guess. Well, Cup six is a player and one is like a, <sighs> on the coaching staff. Didn't realize that seven times Stanley Cup champion. One of the best, you know, hockey he made players the of all time. Every single year of his 18-year career, except for one. Think about wow. that. The guy didn't know what losing was. That's outrageous. Just didn't know what losing was. He guess, tells a, he tells a great story. What? No, go ahead. He tells a great story about Ken Morrow, who I've talked about on this goddamn show. And when he said that name, I'm like, holy shit, I, know, I love Ken Morrow. Yeah. Ken Morrow was on the 1980 Olympic team in 1980. And then in 1980. What year was the 1980? 1980. Olympic team? Okay. And then in 1980, won his first Stanley Cup with the Islanders and then won four cups. So he went from Jesus. a gold medal straight into the NHL season, won a cup, won a cup, won a cup, won a cup, went to the cup of fifth year and didn't win. But what a fucking five years for that guy. Jeez, that's amazing. Yeah. I, was a lot gonna, of hockey I was gonna say it's our um, technically our second interview after we Brian Baumgartner for five minutes, who we ran into today actually. At Tory Pines. Um, we, at had, Pines. we had a very awkward moment where we I almost jumped into the ocean. We knew he was here, we saw him arrive and then we were like, we should go up to him and, and chat with him and especially we tried to get him to do a scramble or whatever. And then we discussed, we were like, do you think he knows who we are? Because anytime we've interviewed him, it's been via Zoom and he does interviews all the time. And we think he's super friendly with us. He is, but like, you pop into fucking 10 Zooms over the course of a week. And yeah. Are you really going to recognize these guys? And Frankie, he was he oh. was clearly doing, because we had our guys with the camera, the giant camera right in our faces. And he was doing the walk by and kind of look at your phone and just... Just whatever's going on over here on the left, don't be part of my world. Look. Yeah. Uh, and then Frankie on. tried to open with a joke, being like, "You just gonna ignore us?" And then he looked over, saw the cameras, and was like, "Yes, and I am." Still going didn't to recognize us. I wanted think. to crawl into a fucking hole when I said, "Brian," and he turns and I said, "What are you just gonna ignore us?" And he made eye contact with me as I said that, and he goes, "I'm not ignoring you guys," and kind of just turned. He's and being continued. nice. He had no clue who it was. My joke did not land. Yeah. And I said, oh, we're the guys from, and I fumbled over my words like I usually do when I'm nervous. I'm like, we're the guys from Barstool. I didn't know if you knew through the camera. And he's like, oh. Yeah. And then, and then was, he was in. Then it was amazing. Yeah. I right. mean, it's Kevin Malone from the fucking office, man. It's yeah. fucking Brian Baumgartner. Then he was hilarious. He was telling stories. He was chirping us. He's talking about golf. So uh, he's here. We ran into him. We're going to play some golf with him. Uh, the interview with Trouty, it's awesome. I'm gonna, li I'm excited to listen to it. I heard it's, it's awesome. 50 minutes, so. 50 minutes, so yeah. people have that coming up. And then, you know, Torrey Pines, like I said, we just played Torrey Pines South the day after we played Olympic Club. We played it from as far back as you can go. Now, Boy. that's like 78 plus. There were only on the part threes that we played it basically one tee box up because they didn't want us taking divots out of the tee boxes, which makes sense. Um, but even the, I don't even think the U.S. Open will be held at 7,800, probably 7,500 or so. And we played it longer than that. And we got murdered. And every time I hit the button on this beautiful Bushnell wingman GPS range finder device, you know, we hit a, a decent tee shot, hit one out there on the right rough like you usually do. And it would be like 278 center. And I'd be like, well, this is a bar four. On the low side, 270, at least for me, because yes. I don't put it out there as far as you guys. It was like 313. It was like, boy. There were times Ugh. it was like 313 center, like 301 front, 340 back. And you're like, oh, okay. This is the no golf this experience thing? on a golf course I've never had before, honestly. And I've played Torrey Pine South before. It's beaten my dick in. I've been on this 18th green with a chance to just par it and break 90, which was always my goal because it's such a hard golf course. And I didn't do it the first time. Coming into the second time, it's just like, what are we fucking doing playing this from 7,800 yards? Never had that experience being, I mean, I was piping drives today. Piping You hit them. the ball well too. You didn't even yeah. post that bad of a score today. No, I didn't. I actually had a better score today from 7,800 than I did at Olympic from 65, which is nuts <laughs> That's very to me. funny. And, um, and I felt like I really didn't play that poorly today, and I barely skimmed you right. on the scores. Barely. I definitely hit the ball well. It's just, I mean, we all know. I, I get into those just like. Those, those yips fits and with the wedges and it's just it, it adds up quick but my point was like I'm bombing drives which like I just can't fathom a guy like Kevin Kisner hitting him that much further right like and I was have I had 265 into par fours and I'm standing there on top of these uh, over these balls being like man how can a guy in a tournament a US Open a championship sorry USGA if they're standing around championship. a championship how can a guy confidently be standing over this ball from like 240 out, let's say, 230, yeah. on a par four and be like, yeah, I'm making three here? That's nuts. With everything on the line, with like history, money, and status it was, on the line. And it was relentless. Like we'd play a par four that was tough and it was into the wind. It was 450. We had three irons in. 
still came up short. And then we get to the next one to be like 527, par, par four. four. You're like, well, what the fuck is this? And you'd finally get to a par five and it would be like 627. Which and I actually think is the easiest part of the golf course, the par fives. Like, yeah, and they're 600 plus yards. Right. So, I mean, you, you murder one. 330, you still have 300 in. Right. That's if you murdered one. Some of these tee boxes were, were, and we like to say it on the podcast, we don't like to say it, laugh out loud funny. Yeah. I mean, yeah. one of them, the 13th hole, we legitimately had to drive. We Like most of them, we just walk back and it's funny. We had to take a separate road to get to the 13th tee box uh, for the U.S. Open tee. But I will say every time we pulled up, it was very nice to hit a button yeah. on the oh, awesome. wingman. I do like that. And boom, all of a sudden this thing just gives you the yardage. And now, again, we, we told this last time, but we can't listen to music when we film videos because if music that you don't own is in the videos, you get in a lot of trouble. So we don't listen to music when we're on video. When we are not on video, we listen to music nonstop. And you have whatever kind of your genre is cranking on this thing. It can go, the, the sprinklers just trying to scroll. I heard that. I was just this about thing to say we should go up there too. Can so go. 36 holes, it has up to 10 hours of battery life. It's got the little remote that you put in your pocket, you just hit a button, and boom, it gives you the distance. And all you gotta do is hook it up to the Bushnell app, and then it shows you the map of the hole. So like Trent and I were in the car together, mm -hmm. we had no idea what was going on because we haven't been here before. We're 550 yards away on a hole that we're supposed to put it into a tiny hole in, the, in four tries, by the way, in four Golf attempts. Golf is so stupid when you think about that. And we pulled up and had absolutely no idea what we were looking at. So we were able to just look on the map on there. You're able to put, you know, you thought, okay, I want to, if I hit it here, I have 112 in, so I need to hit a 200 yard shot from here and then try to get up and down from par like we were doing all day. So this thing's awesome. Go to bushnellgolf.com slash four, order your wingman golf speaker today bushnellgolf.com slash four. It's the only, the only, the world's first golf speaker featuring audible GPS distance and the premium sound quality. So go get the uh, Bushnell it's so good. wingman. It's really cool. There's a real part of me that uh, thinks I shouldn't be allowed to play these golf courses. Do you, you feel were, that way at all? You were as dejected, Trent, as I've ever seen you. It's just frustrating. And I do like to be the positive guy. I think I said it on the last show. But when we play golf courses like this, it's tough. Like, when you and I have been playing recently in the New York area, like, those are golf courses that I should be playing. Lurch has now joined the show. Um, I don't know if we got to turn his mic on. But, um, but then we come out here, we How play 7,800 yards at Torrey Pine South. We played Olympic yesterday. It's just sometimes I don't think I should be allowed on the property. For someone that plays the game like you do where you, you know how to hit the golf ball, you know how to get the ball in the hole at some level, right? Like, you do it. You come out here, you're on a golf podcast, you play. I think you had the toughest day I think I've seen, I've, I've ever played with. I think we have to we're move, gonna we're going to get wet. Let's just get out of here. We were on, listen, we were on the 18th green. We were going to do a whole thing. That's where Tiger Woods putt at Torrey Pines. And it's one of the most iconic putts of all time in golf history. But you know what? It's just not in the cards for us tonight, boys. It's not. Would you expect fucking, anything different? I mean, we're we, trying we so hard. We got a happy Gilmore meet We're just trying not night. to get hit by water right now. Is this okay right here? I'm trying to this keep my fine. legs underneath. Right here. I'm so tired, I'm just trying to keep my legs underneath. Yeah. So uh, so point is, Trent was as dejected as I've ever seen him on the golf course. And what I would tell you, Trent, yeah. is that a little bit of good news is that you're kind of going through what, what we've all gone through a million times, which is like you build up, you build up, you think you've got it. You think you've figured it out to a degree. You think you've turned a corner. Figured. With your game. You had a little trouble there. Did I? Uh, yeah. Where you I'm think so that hungry, we can't even speak. you I can't found a spot speak. where you're like, okay, this is my swing. This is my game. I'm not going to get worse than this. I yep. can bring it every time. And when I really play, I'll play a little bit. And then when you go like five steps backwards, it is the most dejecting. How in the hell did I, as a human being, as an athlete, go from where I was to where I'm at now? And I know part of that's the golf course, but also part of it's just this dumbass game that we do a podcast about all the time. Yeah. Tough two days. Cool. <laughs> I, you said today makes me. I'm good with golf for at least a Dude, month. It I just sucks. Like, just Trent was making so much progress. I've seen it physically. Right. Saw him making progress. I'm like, dude, you're sick of golf, and this sent him back. Right. Light years. <laughs> yeah. We you said five steps. So I would say that was like dude, 40. It, I'm not gonna sh sugarcoat it. It was bad. That yeah. Humbled everybody though. Like right now, I'm like, Phew. like yeah. yesterday I was feeling dangerous. Today I was like, I don't even want to play. Like. What, I'm going to hit a drive out there. Then I'm going to, I kind of heard you guys saying like that I have 270. Then yeah. you smack something else up there. Then it's like a, a, a pitching putt. It's, it's like, the golf course, man. It really is. Like, really we say it's not, but it is. And like, it's always it's, champagne it's problems when we talk about Kevin it that Kisner way. But like, talks, like he goes, US Open, not going to win it, can't win right. it. Like, that's just like 
it's just the way it is, man. For like us, it should just be not going to play it. Right. Like, not, like, you know what I mean? And this is what we have, you know, long defended ourselves and our take of, like, no, no, when we show up to a course, uh, we're not looking to go all the way back. We're not these macho alpha tough guys. We don't give a fuck. What we no, want to do God, is no. live in this 6,500-yard range where you can have a few long par fours. You can have a lot of shorter par fours. You can have reachable par fives. You can have a couple longer and a couple shorter par threes and have yourself a great time and enjoy it and play the course more like the pros play it in terms of yardage where, like, you're going to have eight irons and nine irons in instead of fucking three iron and then a pitching wedge all right. day three wood and then something else but this was for the video we came out here and we wanted folks to see when we put this shit out trent just took That's his shoes nice off in the middle of the they podcast. just had my shoes had to come off I just, <laughs> i'm sorry to interrupt your thought but my shoes just had to you come take off take your shoes off bro <laughs> but they the they just off. they just have to you're lucky my pants are still on i'm just <laughs> the, the the shoes had to come off we uh, played against and alongside pros and i don't know that i've ever had more respect for what they do than today not being with them and playing something like this at Torrey Pines South. Yeah. I really don't. I don't know. Yeah. You can shoot under I, We've legitimately, like, we've legitimately seen Kevin Kisner, Pat Perez, all these guys up close, Dustin Johnson, ever heard of him? All these guys with Taylor Made. Thank you, Taylor Made, for that experience. But um, I've never in my life, like standing over balls today, I've, I, all day I was just stepping back being like, how? How do they hit this green in two? And how do they make a three? Yes. How? Was that the 17th you were looking at? We it was, were like, it was, um, six, no, 17. It no, was six, 18. Just being like, right? Or 16. We so it was 16 back. or 18. Yeah, but it's just like, how did, oh, it was 16. Like, it was 16. Because you were like, how could you make a par from here? Like, you need to make a par. How yeah. Do you make a par I think it was the 15. 15. Oh, that, 15. That, like, 527 par four. 16. The a point is three. every hole. The whole thing we're talking about right now is every single hole out here kicks My you in the dick. Mashed potato. And it's going to be very fun to watch because it's going to be carnage. They're going to get destroyed, but they're also going to play it pretty well and it's going to have a uh it's going to give me a lot more appreciation for it right like when patrick reed just broke a wedge over his hands and pebble yeah. guess what he was playing in the u.s open Makes sense. i almost stepped on a hybrid today and just snapped it and that's like the closest <laughs> i've come to breaking club ever like i don't think i've ever broken yeah i think if somebody in this group were going to break a club it would have been today if it was Dude, ever going to happen it would have yeah. been today i was playing a little bit better and like i was getting a nice like string of holes together and i had a hybrid in my hand and the ball was sitting up nice in the rough and I'm like I am going to fucking lace this thing I felt really well really good about it I was feeling good and I just dribbled it into the bunker in front of me and I kind of just looked at this fucking <laughs> shaft and I'm like just step on it man it's gonna make you feel <laughs> so, so right, much man. better but I just didn't want to deal with all that shit so I just didn't and I kind of looked up at the sky being like you know what I I a club has it coming for him because today I, I saved so? the club's life. Yes. At some point, that club was supposed to be dead. I don't today. think we're club break guys. We're no, not. We're, we're not. not but it, been, yeah, no. My doubt. bag, today my bag like is down a club stupid. mentally. Like I, and there they was owe me one. it was funny because there was a lot of um, you know maniacally laughing at yourself moments that then eventually no. each person eventually got to a kind of serious. I'm actually pissed moment. Dude, it just sucks. For I like, was mad. Dude. My, I'm pissed. I think I was the most pissed off when I. When you just miss the putt, it's like behind the hole, and you can't just whack it into Neverland because they're playing everything down. Yeah. You have to gently <laughs> tap it against the stick, and it's like that. In those moments, I wanted to just you have to have on. these dainty, soft hands right. and just softly oh, brush wanna, it into wanna, the hole. I don't want to. I don't want to play this game anymore. Oh yeah, let's not like. Yeah, we didn't this, even really like talk about that. Like we played 7,800 yards, ball in hole. Yep. Oh, Legitimately yeah. ball in hole. Everything. So I think this course is. Maybe ten times harder um, than uh, Olympic. Olympic club. Oh, Olympic, but then. Uh, sorry. Remember when I said wing yesterday? foot? Wing foot. Thank you. Remember what I said yesterday I to you guys? Harder. Remember what I said to you guys yesterday? I'm oh, like, uh, oh, yeah. tomorrow's test is gonna be. <laughs> you said two to three times harder. Two to three times harder, and you said that's not even golf. Yeah. Right? And I said now, if, if, if yeah. it's two to three times harder than when we played Olympic, it's a different sport. Now, yeah. after playing today, do you think that assessment was kind of fair? I think it wasn't even close. <laughs> today was. A thousand okay. Because <laughs> I, I, I was like, I was being real with them. I'm like, dude, tomorrow is going to be like two to three times harder than this. I remember having a wedge in on two. And then after that, I don't, I think the closest club that I had into a green was a four iron. You know, I had a six iron a couple, but like. It was just relentless. You know what it was? It, it, it felt like when you play with a, a really small child who's playing a full golf course, but is a child and not a full human. Yes. And it's like, oh, they're playing a normal length par four that we're all playing. It's going to take them about four to get to the green. Yeah. That's cool. It's like an old man. That's cute. That yeah. was us. It was like, I would hit a tee shot and they'd be like, all right, now maybe two more shots. I could get it on the green on this average length par four for what this <laughs> tournament is, championship is. 
the rough wasn't even that long. No, it was no. sticky. Yeah, like your club didn't just rip through it. Like it wasn't like that course would be more difficult. That's Way more difficult. Impossible. <laughs> the fact that some human being, some mere mortal, could come out here and shoot below par. On a par 71. It's embarrassing. They should be embarrassed. <laughs> they should that they be. can do anything like that. <laughs> yeah. Like, the fact that they can come out here and play this golf course that way is embarrassing to me. Yeah. It's infuriating. How how good of a venue is it, though? Because, oh. like, we love Carnage. We love the U.S. Open. We love the way the USGA sets it up. Like, that's just something. We are team golf course. We're team establishment. We so, like, at the end of the day... This what you, team yeah, establishment is a, is a weird one. I don't know that I'd put it that I way. I don't want to be under the team establishment umbrella. Well, I meant like the USGA. I oh, yeah, you. we love the USGA. Correct. Spitting after it was strong. When you yeah. got a question, you would spit yeah. a little bit. That felt like... My mouth so dry and hungry <laughs> that I'm like I trying to... The visuals, the visuals and like this is kind of what we want out of the US Open, right? <laughs> it is <laughs> brutally <laughs> difficult. It's going to be stunning. The vistas, the drone shots, all of that. Today, especially like when we put this video out, people are going to go nuts because the cliff shots, we had all the hang yeah. gliders were out there. We had helicopters all over. It is visually just as stunning a place as you can be. But you don't want to play it. It reminded me no. of Whistling Straits a bit, like when we played Whistling yeah. Straits a couple of years ago, where it was just like, yeah, yeah. people were like, what'd you think? And I was like, I just wish I didn't play it. I wish I just right. visited it. I, yeah. like, it was it was yeah. so brutal. Oh, you the made, views are great. Yeah. You made, Riggs made the point of like, if someone asked you to come play this course in a week from 7800 yards, <laughs> you'd be like, keep I it. I would just I say no. Not, right, absolutely not. I'm no. I'll I'd rather play mini golf. I'll go get a massage. <laughs> like, I'm just yeah. not going to do I it. I would rather sit and like stream. 2K with you guys. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I'd never want to play this from that length ever again. No. It was just. I don't know that anyone should. I don't even know if you can. I think like yeah. a lot of the times they're like just blocked off for safety reasons. The other thing is, I didn't hit any fairways. Did it, I mean, it's, it's very like, hard. When you're like almost to step zero. On your eyes. I mean, it was, and then if you don't hit a fairway, you like can't hit a green. Like, so you step you up to do? a 535 yard par four. It's not that easy to hit a fairway Look, when you're trying to I get absolutely that lace a driver. We sound like four defeated humans. It's because we are, which is what we want out of the U.S. Open. So this video will be coming out in a few weeks. It'll be coming out U.S. Open week. Um, we filmed every single shot, and Oof. we just got murdered and defeated and beat up. And you're going to get to see all of that footage. You also now get to listen to an NHL legend. You get to listen to our guys, Frankie and Trent, interview this NHL legend. <laughs> Trent's already, already. It, it went well. Trent can't even stand up. No, it, yeah. It's no, also I'm, just very funny that like me and Trent just did that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like I'm kind of nervous harder. for people to sit here and just like listen to it right now. Yeah, I think it went I well. I think it's yeah. gonna be great. Trent yeah. told me it went great. It was like Gretzky story. I heard it's really good. Yeah. So that's coming up next. Um, reminder, folks, that there are very high quality shades out there for far less than expensive brands. Shady Rays, our friends, have one of the best warranties in the entire sunglass industry. They are premium polarized shades at a fraction of the price of big name brands. You do not need to overpay for sunglasses that don't hold up in the outdoors or are just going to get roughed up anyways. I have like six pair of Shady Rays and they're phenomenal. Uh, phenomenal. And you know what I'm talking about on the course when you get out mm -hmm. there you don't have a great pair of sunglasses and it's you can't hit shots with sunglasses on. I pretty much, like when it was really sunny out and it's a little windy, I'm able to just wear the Shady Rays the entire round. I just ordered my Shady Rays. Okay. It's from the men's collection. Okay, that's good. Good stuff. It is the Ventura Limited Blackout Polarized Sunglasses. I have those. They're awesome. And, I, you know, I went through the website. I made, I, I really, really, I, I got it down to like three options. I picked yep. my favorites. I put them in all new tabs, and I just went one, two, three. I just kept flipping back and forth. Which one do I like? And I fell on the Ventura. The person that I, you know, when I, when I did it, I actually got an email back from me like, what an amazing decision. <laughs> on that on that spec yeah so shady rays knows it was a good decision i can't wait for it to come to my house i can't wait to wear them it's summertime it's springtime we're gonna be wearing sunglasses i actually wore i wore shady rays my old ones not the new ones not the ventura i had old shady rays i wore them to a communion and i just got all the pictures back and i look fucking cool man oh yeah i left them on for all the communion pictures but i thought it's it was hot. weird it was outside okay underneath a nice like like a yeah, blooming cool. tree yeah. but i no will one say you can wear them inside too i looked People awesome I looked awesome. Like, you're I just, just got the pictures. and are stunting on communion. Dude, everyone's like, because you can't, I'm the guy wearing the sunglasses in the picture, so you almost gravitate to it. Yeah. Like, look at that guy wearing sunglasses. Look at that suit. Good, like, uh, you yeah. can't be wearing sunglasses inside. I'm saying Shady Rays, are, or you can be wearing them anyway. You can wear them anyway. That's what they are. They're great. They're amazing. They're very uh, I'd say style. stick to outside. <laughs> yeah. You can, you can wear them right. inside. Yeah. It's not illegal, but no. outside is where you want to wear Change them. the way you wear sunglasses and join the team that is your back for life. Shady Rays is running their deepest deal of the season exclusively for us and for you guys listening. Use the code 4 for 50% off two or more pairs 
at ShadyRays.com. Buy one, get one free. You can get two pair for $48. Redeem only at ShadyRays.com where you can find all their newest and best shades and they have a phenomenal warranty deal. That's code for ShadyRays.com. You get 50% off two or more pair. ShadyRays.com, code for. Here's Brian Trottier. All right, I am truly honored to introduce a living legend, a man that I literally look up to. You know, I, I see your name hanging from the rafters at Nassau Coliseum every single game I go to. This man played 18 seasons in the National Hockey League, a seven-time Stanley Cup champion, four in a row with the New York Islanders. He won a Hart Memorial. He won a Conn Smythe. He won the Calder, the King Clancy. <laughs> the list goes on and on. The all-time leader in points for the New York Islanders, 1,353 points. That's a number I can't even fathom. All-time leader in assists. All-time leader in games played. All of these accomplishments have led him to the Hockey Hall of Fame, and now he sits here on the Four Play Golf Podcast somehow, some way. Brian Trottier, welcome to the show. I am so honored to speak to you. What an intro, and guys, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. On top of it, all it takes is an invite, and I'm there. Man, you know, it's I, a party I'm in. Oh, I heard, man, I, oh man, I heard you Barstool guys are at a party. Yeah, you know, <laughs> we, we like to party from here uh, from time to time, but we also love to, uh, we love to play golf. We love to watch some hockey. Um, so you are the perfect guest for us to have today. Thank you. Um, just, just right off the bat, you're, you're, you're releasing this NFT. Um, it's a new NFT collection. Yeah. I want to, I want to get that in off the bat. Thanks. Um, so basically what it is, is it's these, it's these biggest moments in your career, right? So people can now go in, they can bid on them. You have the six point period where you had a six point period game. And, and basically this NFT is, is, is in capture capturing this great moment in your career. Um, so I think that's a really cool thing that you're diving into a new a, a new you know platform and letting people. That's that as that's as new as it gets. It's as new like as a, it gets. NFTs are like that's something like I feel I feel like I don't I even totally understand. Guys, <laughs> I'm going new millennium here. Like, yes, leave me alone. Like I'm not I'm not sucking cities anymore. <laughs> you know what's really fun about this is I know little about it, but I th I really it's really fun. It's a digital hockey card basically yep. that that shares one of my greatest experiences or some of my great experiences. So I am so excited in the sense that for hockey fans or people who enjoy that kind of uh, experience or the memorabilia aspect of it, to share that now at this time of my life is very, very special. So yes, I'm extremely excited. I think it's uh, nouveau. I am, it's beyond my concept when it comes to technology, but the fact that the artists are, are excited, the, uh, the memorabilia market is excited about it and it's new, it's exciting. Thank you for bringing it up. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it so really is a shot in the arm for memorabilia because yep. I mean, I grew up collecting cards, baseball cards, football cards, Pokemon <laughs> cards, even. And, and, and now they've got this new generation of NFTs where if you think about it as a trading card, if you think about it in that way, that's really all that it is. And it is, seems like it's the next frontier of memorabilia and collecting. Well, do you remember, like, I, I would grab all these hockey cards for my son. He goes, Dad, you find any cards of yourself? Go grab. And I'd be in there saying, hey, you got any Trache cards? And the guy going, are you Brian Trache? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so we filled our basement full of, like, all these stackable little hockey cards that eventually took up all underneath our stairway. <laughs> and I cracked up at myself because now you can put them in cloud. You know, now they're right. stored up in cloud. Floating, which I don't even <laughs> no understand. Space, no space taken in the house. So I, 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 I applaud the technology of this because I don't understand it. But I think for everybody who does and enjoys the idea of having a little something that, you know, marks something in, in that's special to them. And I'm a little part of it. Hey, bravo. I, I'm, I'm all in. One of the cool things that you guys are doing also is uh, you're, you're adding a real life experience, which I haven't really seen with NFTs, right? It's usually a digital thing, but if you got the six point period NFT, they also can win like a real experience with you, whether it's golfing or go to an NHL game with you, which I think is a really cool wrinkle into it. Cause it, it is digital, but also like you're, they're able to meet you and they're able to play golf with you, um, which I think is awesome. Well, we think, we think the idea of, of making it beyond the experience is really good. And it's, it's a little more magical that way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I enjoy meeting people. I enjoy the aspect of uh, mini entertaining or, or just telling stories. And it, it lights up every, and they get an opportunity to share some time, FaceTime, not just FaceTime in front of a computer, but face to FaceTime. And uh, I think that that brings it to reality in a sense, because although it's digital, now the experience, uh, face-to-face, -face, I think, just adds that it's real excitement to it. 
You better watch out. My, my guy Frankie might get involved in your NFT, and he want, he'll probably want to go to a hockey game with you. And he is he is the biggest. Uh, he so he's obviously a gigantic Islanders fan, but he's also we the biggest. Frankie. We want Frankie. <laughs> he is he's the biggest fan of any sport of any team that I've ever met. He's a legit almost a lunatic, but he might want to go to a game with you with after your NFT. Hundred percent. Let's go. Let's go. We got the new we got the new building come up. Belmont's coming up in the fall, so there's lots of excitement going on in with the Islanders. You know they're. They're pushing for that first place all the time here. They're they're playing well. They're an exciting team, you know. They're always in it. You can't count them out. They're down whether they're up. With it's always a they're they're gonna fight. They're gonna scrap. And so like yeah, no, I'm in. We'll go to an Islander game anytime. Come on, Frankie. Oh, oh, man. And listen, you know, I, my history with the Islanders is so my family has a restaurant across from the Nassau Coliseum called Borelli's Italian Restaurant. Yeah. And you guys, and it's so crazy that my whole life has gotten to this point where I'm actually able to talk to you about the Islanders and in interview because they used to be on top of the restaurant while you guys would go down Hempstead Turnpike uh, for those four years winning the cup. And it was such a great experience for my family that there's so much history in my name and my family with the Islanders that it, it really is crazy to, you know, even be able to, like I said, I've said it 10 times, but even to be able to see you and speak to you, um, it's nuts to me. Well, to me, it's really fun to have – the shared experience of all the, whether it's a restaurant, a bar, um, a community, a family, there's something that attacks, attaches themselves to the Islanders yeah. or to an individual of the Islanders. But Borelli, we remember Borelli's very well. And oh, uh, there's a million stories we could share. And uh, one of my favorites is, uh, is, is either post game and, and going in there and, and just having walking in and everybody's like, wow, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, we're just trying to have a little bit deep. And, but that was fun. And uh, so like, no, it's, it's very, very special time. And I'm glad, uh, I'm glad your family was a part of it. That's awesome. It gave me the chills just even talking about that. So let's get into it real quick. So 1974, you get drafted to the Islanders. Um, the team had only been around for two years. What did you know about Long Island prior to that? You know, a Canadian boy coming over to New York. Did you know much about it? No, it was uh, <clears throat> Long Island. We knew was just a, an extension of of New York. Basically, it was, you know, um, Queens, then Long Island, and we didn't know. I, I had no clue what Long Island looked like. I had no clue what it was about. Um, but when I was drafted, I went to Montreal that year, and Bill Torrey told me I'm going back to junior, which I was fine because I was, you know, just 17 years old, 18 years old, and I needed to grow. I was small, five eight, 170 pounds, and um, I knew I had to grow. I was, uh, I felt confident in the sense of skills, but I wasn't, you know, man strength yet. And uh, that year back with Earl Ingerfield as my coach and him talking about the NHL and him mentoring me and the speed of the game, the strength of the players, the, the, uh, the opportunity to play with great players against great players and test yourself, gauge yourself, just really rev me up. And was, 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 that was important for me. I put on, you know, almost 15 pounds, grew another couple inches and, Going into training camp in the fall was pretty darn exciting because I I went out to New York and saw a little bit of Long Island. I saw, you know, the Nassau Coliseum, um, the airport, uh, the Island Inn. Those are my three. Those are my go-to. <laughs> you know, right there in the big city of uh, Westbury. But it was all really exciting because the excitement around the team, a young team, a nucleus of team. Clark Gillies was a a junior player I played against. We were drafted together. Bobby Bourne, a junior player, we were drafted together. So I had a couple Western boys on the team, Dave Lewis. So I felt comfortable there. And Western guys kind of hung together. And so that familiarity kind of embraced me a little bit. With the last name Trache, I was French. So the Potvins, the J.P. Parisi, Jude Drew, and Andre Saint Laurent, they they adopted me. I was like, oh, good. I'm 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 going with French guys tonight. And so I, I, I felt like there was like a little bit of like engage, like I felt and that little bit of a, uh, an opportunity to kind of put myself right into the nucleus here and training camp started, boom, I was, uh, didn't score a point, didn't get anything done in, in training camp. I had everything that moved. Al Arbor came up to me after training camp. We're going to keep you around for a while, kid. I had six or seven more games, maybe nine. And before they sent me back to junior, if I didn't do well, boom took off like game two, I think Nassau Coliseum five point game hat trick and never looked back. But, you know, Billy Harris, right wing Clark Gillies, the power play, you know, Dennis Podvin, everything just started to click. 
and when things are clicking, you ride that wave. And, you know, two weeks into the season, <laughs> I'm neck and neck with Guy Lafleur in the scoring race. And I'm like, this can't, this is surreal. This can't be real. And uh, Al Arbor said, look, you better find yourself a place to stay. So I bunked in with a family for the year and they're still my surrogates. I, I love them to death. The Amandolo. So there's just so many exciting things that happened to me that year in New York. I remember getting invited to my first Italian dinner and I was so excited. And I go, I go, I'm, I'm, you know, it's like a 10 course meal. Of course, everything is like perfect. And it's out on kind of like, you know, where the fork is. And I, you know, drive out an hour and it's yeah. really kind of, by the time I get there, it's dark. And I'm very excited because this is my, the, another family that's embracing me and inviting me to a dinner in Long Island and Saskatchewan, you're invited to a, to someone's house for dinner, man, you're like, you're like family now. So I <laughs> go to the house, I sit down, I'm sitting right next to their daughter. I'm like, Oh my God, I think I'm getting married. <laughs> <laughs> They're setting you up. They're setting you up for a new. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I learned a quick lesson there, but it was, uh, that was, re- that was really fun to, 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 to find all the wonderful, I, I think, interest, just the fun parts of Long Island, you know, the different communities, the different, the the, the things that made each community uh, kind of there, South Shore, North Shore, North Fork, Hamptons. I mean, there's just so many things that made Long Island special. So four Stanley Cups in a row, right? You, you started getting going, like you said, game two, and it was off to the races. But what is it about that team, right? I feel like people don't take a step back enough and say what you guys did is like unthinkable of four straight Stanley Cups. What about that team? What happened? It was crazy. Like there was some, there, there, there's some special um, things that happened, some special players that came on the team uh, through that growth. Because like in 77, 78, um, we had a couple, we had Mike Boss, he was, was, was fresh, goal scoring machine. Um, the power play was red hot, but we go up against Toronto, we lose. Next year, 79, we go up against the Rangers, we lose. And expectations are high. We learned how to deal with expectations. Then on top of it, some major trades. Butch Goring comes. Kenny Moore, team. We get Dwayne Sutter from junior hockey. You know, we get Dave Langevin and John Tonelli from the world hockey. There's just a whole bunch of things that just kind of like meshed. And all of a sudden, the chemistry took off. Um, we got challenged. We got challenged at the right time from the right teams, whether it was the Triple Crown line in L.A., where there was the French connection in Buffalo, there was always something in front of us that took a challenge. Al was terrific. Al was great. Our coach, Al Arbor, was terrific. He put the challenge in front of us, and the guys responded. He goes, hey, you know, there's uh, 600 million people in China that don't care. And Dave Langevin said, it's $2 billion, Al. <laughs> you, know, but, you know, like he just made it kind of put it down and, and brought it down, the expectations. And, and at the same time, our sense of wanting to accomplish something that sense of we don't want to look over our shoulder and have people say what if what if what if it's now and we so we embraced it the core of 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 that four stanley cup teams stayed together i think there's 14 or 16 players that were on all four cups oh. a special group of guys because every one of those guys contributed in some way it wasn't just scoring a goal it was blocking a shot it was doing something that everybody appreciated and when you appreciate each other there's a acknowledgement of worth and everybody left that team feeling like, man, I gave my very best and everybody thanked me. Whether you looked in the guy in the eye, you know, give him a fist pump, a little tap on the shin pads. That's all a hockey player needs. Just acknowledgement. Um, Al was terrific. I mean, Bill Torrey was terrific. He kept that nucleus together. He, he kind of pulled in a player or two through those years and just added like Mike, Mike McEwen one year or whoever it was. And we always kind of said to ourselves, you know, let's, we had that core and that chemistry. The chemistry is very important. And you'll, you'll hear that a lot, whether it's with Chicago Bulls and, and uh, you know, the Steelers of the 80s. Like, everybody talks about chemistry. And that chemistry that we had as a group was very special because when we get together, to, it's like everybody goes back to that locker room and we all take that identity again, all nicknames, you know, and, you know, the pecking pole of a, of a locker room and who gets picked on and who gets yelled at. And, who get, and it's just so comical because it's fun. You know, right. it, it makes us ageless in that sense. But uh, I was walking, I was, I was walking, well, actually I was sitting in the air, airplane the other day. Well, it's probably two, three years ago now. And this guy's looking at me across the aisle I'm like, who's going to recognize me at my age? You know, thinning hair, 
gray hair and whiskers and everything. <laughs> and the guy looked at me and he's looking at me. And I thought I could catch him. Every time I looked at him, he looked away. And finally our eyes locked and he goes, Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I thought I recognized you. You look exactly like Brian Trache, only older. <laughs> And I, was like, I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but I'll take it. You know, like, and then I, I just, out of the blue, I just threw back at him like, yeah, I wonder ever happened to him. And the guy goes, just as like, he's like, ah, he's probably dead. Like, it was just so comical. He had no clue I was actually Brian Trotch. It was so great. Oh, like, my God. <laughs> I like how you said the other day, and then I was like, oh, it was three years ago. I do that all the time, where I say, like, yeah, that happened just the other day. And I was like, that was 10 years ago. I was like, oh, man, I screwed that up. But that's so funny. You know what's funny about that? The people don't know much about this, but you guys are were trendsetters, not only obviously winning the Cups, but the playoff beard. It's one of my favorite stories that I've heard you tell, that yeah. the New York Islanders were the originator of the playoff beard. So many teams now in all different sports have adopted that. Well, it was the year before I came. And the, the, the Islands were down to the Rangers. Actually, they, they were, there was like three game series and they won that series. And they were down three nothing against the Penguins. And they decided not to shave till they won the series. And so they went through that whole series. They won the series. They came back and won that series four games to three. Then they went up against Philadelphia and they kept their beards. They went down three nothing. And they figured, oh, my God, we're going to do the Lucky Beard thing and, and keep it going again. And they came back to tied 3-3 and lost in Game 7 when uh, the uh, the Game 7 in Philadelphia. So, unfortunately for them, you know, but the beard thing started. And it became a trend that stays in the NHL today. Playoff beards. Boom, let's go. Yep. I had these little tiny whiskers back in the good old days. You know, like eight whiskers here. You're like a little bit of whisker here. Now you're talking straight to me now. I can't grow any facial hair. Maybe a, <laughs> a little sideburns for whatever reason, but no figure. Anyway, when the playoffs beard happened, the guys were like, well, Trot, you do the best you can. Like, you know, it's really comical for like two or three years. And all of a sudden, everything started coming in. Fell up, fell off up here and started growing out up here. I'm like, God is funny. Like he just makes everything go south, gravity, whatever it is. But it was just, uh, but that that sense of history and the beards and the start of the playoff beards and the fact that the Islanders started the whole thing. And I can remember like J.P. Parisi had a full beard in like two days. Drew Druin had a full beard in two days. Dennis Potvin had a full beard in two days. And there I am with like eight whiskers right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely made up for it with the with the you know your physicality on the ice. I love watching highlights of the way you played the game. Uh, we noticed. That'd yeah. Be noticed. Now the way you played the game, do you think that that would? Because we've had debates, especially now, 2021, the way the NHL is now, it's skill based, right? Like they have to find the smallest amount of net to to get past these goalies at this point, right? Scoring a goal is nearly impossible these days. Do you do you feel like your game would have translated well? because you were such a skilled and then no one can knock you off your skates. Like you were such a strong skilled centerman. You know, the really fun thing is, is like, we would like, we would love the chance to gauge ourselves in today's game um, with the training they have and the, yeah. the diet, nutrition, everything else that they have, you know, the, the uh, everything that they do is geared towards excelling to their very best. And these guys are machines. I mean, they're fantastic, wonderful athletes. We didn't have that kind of training. We, we, were, we were doing the best we can at the time. And uh, we thought we were doing very good. You know, we brought in aerobics. We brought in, like, stretching. We brought in a whole bunch of things that were nouveau to the game with the, our Islander team. And we felt good. It was all, like, uh, injury prevention. Or it was always, like, improve our stamina and, and recovery. And for us, we felt pretty proud to be that part of that whole experiment with um, training and Ron Woski, who was like, uh, you know, just uh, just a very mentor to all of us, you know, even though he was basically only a few years older than us, but he brought all this, this wonderful education to us and training and performance. And now you see the players today and uh, nobody looks at me and I've got 524 goals, but nobody looks at me and goes, oh, there goes Brian Trache that, you know, that 500 goal scorer. Yeah, but you look at Mike Bossy, oh, what a goal scorer, you know, 570 <laughs> goals. Oh, there goes Gila Fleur, 530 goals. My, my God, what a goal scorer. And, and I, but I, I think what's really fun for me is if I talk to 500 goal scorers, Mario Lemieux, Wayne Gretzky, Gilbert Perot, Mike Bossy, some of the very best, Marcel Dion, and I say to them, how do you think you'd get score, you'd do against today's goaltenders? You know, the big equipment and, you know, it seems like there's a little bit in it and they're big guys. I mean, our goalies, you know, you got Darren Pang, who's like five foot two, 
you know, 116 pounds soaking wet and he's got the little equipment on and he, and he's athletic. I mean, Darren did fantastic, but now you got these big goalies. They're all over six foot. They're covering a lot of net, even on their knees. They're, they're, they're they look like Ken Dryden to me, you know, like right. they're, they're like covering the top part of the net and uh, not a one of them, not one of them, even flinch. They're like, yeah, I'd find a way. And that's really kind of the confidence. I think that, that, oh, I don't want to say the very, very best have, but the very best goal scorers have is like, they want that challenge. They want to like, they just believe that they'll find a hole. And, and that's how I, not that I was like the greatest goal scorer, like, but I, every time I shot, I'm like, that'll find a hole, get it on the net. It'll find a hole, make the goalie, make a save. If he doesn't make a save, there'll be a rebound. Something good will happen. And a lot of times it finds a hole and it's a confidence thing. I think when you, when you shoot the puck with confidence, I think something good's going to happen something good will happen. Either it'll go in, rebound, you know, give yourself a chance, law of averages, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, in, in, in rooming with Mike Bossy and hearing some of his, I don't know, just his, his philosophy, you know, like, yeah, just put it on the net and make the goalie make a save. Sometimes I put it low. Sometimes I put it up by his ears. Sometimes I put it, you know, by his glove. Sometimes I'll throw it five hole. And I love that. Cause you, you kind of, you, you feed off that kind of confidence. So, uh, you know, he was vital. I think for me to have kind of the success, success that I had, because it seemed like I threw the puck over to the right side. Mike scored a goal. It's like, Oh, what a great assist by Brian Trotter. I'm like, I just passed him the puck. <laughs> yeah. He did the rest with his snapshot or quick shot or slap shot, heavy shot. And, uh, some of the best, best goal scorers, what I've heard, because I'm not a goalie, but talking to our goalies like Chico Resch and Billy Smith and some of the other goalies like Tony Esposito, when those, when those players shoot the puck, it's heavy shot. And I used to say, what's a heavy shot? Well, my shot hits the goalie and it just falls down. Right. Their shot hits the goalie and boom, it throws them backwards. And that's the difference. Dennis Potman's wrist shot was a heavy wrist shot and it hit the goalie you'd hear boom and my hit my shot hits the goalie, like pink so what goes into that do you think like is it just they're born with it because you see that in baseball also a heavy fastball same mile per hour but it just makes a different sound when it hits the catcher's mitt isn't that the truth and it's it just i don't know it must be technique uh, i say to myself is it wrist spin on the puck i don't know but these guys have that t- knack whether it's a gift from birth whether it's just something they practiced over and over my dad had it my dad was a righty and i was a lefty and he taught me how to shoot righty and i wish i would have stayed with it but every time i got into a game i'd flip over to lefty it felt more comfortable with my right hand on the top and uh, he'd yell at me and oh, i'd just flip it back and so i was kind of the, one of those guys that kind of went back and forth for a couple of years when i was playing hockey but when you finally score your first goal and then uh you know your dad says oh i guess you are a lefty sort of thing <laughs> You know, but I never, I, I was just trying to get the puck on the net. I was kind of like, like Phil Esposito. Like I tr- talked to Phil and Phil's like, no, oh, my shot wasn't that hard, but I put it on the net. I made the goalie make a save and goalies hated that. They hated the fact that you had that off speed, that off speed shot after they're waiting for that, you know, that 90 mile an hour, Mike Bossy, here comes Brian Trotchy, 52 miles an hour. Hit him <laughs> with a change up. <laughs> yeah, big change up. Like, <laughs> so what? what... Folks, our landing page is now live. You go to barstoolsports.com slash tailormade. We have pictures of us up there. We took uh, professional photos, by the way. It was weird. If we're being real about yeah. it. It was a weird day. It was a weird day. We did day. it inside like a, a very tight uh, three or four level gambling house in Philadelphia right. for Barstool Sports. It's a golf com. podcast. We talk about golf. We play golf. We make golf we videos. We didn't do it on a golf course. And we took our professional pictures in a gambling house in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, in a kitchen somewhere. With a green screen and a, and a cameraman. It's who a was great super landing nice. page, but it was a weird day. It was super nice. Go? I had like puffy, um, just woke up eyes, kind of. It was just, I was tired. I got there a little late. I rushed there. And I remember just like, right when I walked in, they just were like, here's a photo of you. And I'm like, okay, here we go. It's going on the TaylorMade landing page. The thing that made a bearable page. was that it's TaylorMade. It's on our own landing page. And look, there's a lot of things that we can plug. We obviously are obsessed with the Sim 2s. We all, we know that. We're obsessed with the P770s, P790 irons. Yep. The thing that I think I'm, I'm most qualified right now to hype up are their high toe wedges and the spider putter. Um, because if it weren't for those things, I'd be I'd be borderline shooting higher than Trent. Your short game I, is... Without your short game, without your wedges today, I think you would have shot like in the hundreds. Today I hit it better than yesterday. Or the yesterday. last two days, I guess, just like... Yesterday. Yes, yesterday. Yes, I agree with that. 
But today it's, I had some insane up and Yesterday downs as well. you shot like a right. phenomenal score. I've shot a pretty damn good score. Well, those daily nines are paying off because you're short. Game. I would say today too, dude, like, dude. Today you were good again. Yeah, like, I, I mean you hit the ball a lot better today, but I'm, it, it saves you. It really does. It's incredible. You and big thanks to Taylor made in the high toe wedges and the spider. I I also like I just made a lot of putts you're supposed to make yeah. over the course of these last two days. That spider, I just think, man, it's really difficult with that thing when you when you trust it inside of like eight feet and you have the line, if you're reading the green, you're go, you just like hit the thing online. So I love yeah. the spider, I love the high toe wedges, and we're obsessed with all the TaylorMade gear. So do yourself a favor, go to barstoolsports.com slash TaylorMade, look at our funny photos that we took, <laughs> check out all their gear, the tour response ball that we talk about a lot, right? A lot of times you don't want to go and spend the most for the most expensive golf ball. You think, do I really need that? Tour response is tour quality golf ball with the spin, with the distance, without paying kind of the highest price you could pay for golf. One balls. of our guys, for Michael Barbuti, he's helped us a lot behind the scenes. I don't know if we've ever talked about him on the show. He's an incredible human being. Yeah. He helped our, he uh, he um, was actually playing Tory today and brought a seven iron because I missed my seven iron at Olympic. I lost it. By the way, it's been found. A lot of people were tweeting at me, what is, what's the ending story here without your seven iron and 52? Where it's, was it? They've both been found at Quaker. Yeah. Just under a tree. I just like, they're just like out there <laughs> under a tree, a tree. just <laughs> maybe it was a decision like hit it low both hit it high I went with something else and oh, they both the just stayed spot. there same I guess, tree. yeah so same yeah, that's just where they are um, they're waiting for me at Quaker so Barbuti actually brought me a seven iron it was ended up being like a regular shaft and like mid-sized grips and everything my point being it just doesn't matter it didn't matter because the club head is so good oh, yeah. that I hit I mean I hit my seven iron today I don't think I miss it at once yeah. and I, I'm on 18 I ended up making a par on 18 at Torrey Pine South I hit a seven iron into the green it, it stayed up on the ridge and didn't go in the water I'm like man it's this is just the 790s it's just tailor me I love the 790s yeah. it, so yeah, nothing there. about the specs were my specs and I still just oh, hit a pure shot uh, Check out our landing page, barstoolsports.com slash tailor get you know become a tailor made athlete like us it's uh, it's worth it trust me what do you think about these players now, right? You got Connor McDavid and Austin Matthews, right? And like, they're never going to be able to get to 180 points in a season or 160, right? So at the end of their careers, they'll never. I always struggle with this. Like, a Connor McDavid is a is a once in a, a, a generation talent, but he'll he'll never go down as like the greatest of all time or like one of the greats because he can't get to those points. You know what I mean? Like, he'll never get to that level. Do you, do you like put any weight on that? Like, wh where where do you fall on that? Yeah, not at all. Like, I like it's a different it's a different monster today. Like, you look at what Ovechkin's done over his right. Career. You know, he's just been a goal scoring machine, and even the greatest goal scorers are marvelled by him. And I, I I find a they'll find a way. Like Connor McDavid will find a way. Like just like Sidney Crosby finds a right. way. Just like you know Patrick Kane finds a way. these great players find a way to push themselves into that elevation of being spectacular okay greatest of all time spectacular uh, dynamic like bring bring the fans out of the bring us you know former hockey players who are fans of the games you know make us marvel and uh, they do so yeah Connor mcdavid all these kids that are that are coming up god bless them you know Matthews, I'm, I'm a big, big fan of these kids. And now you just pull for them because you want them to be the next ambassador of the game and you want them to carry that torch high and, and excel and excel to their best of their ability, you know, stay healthy and all those wonderful things because Connor McDavid, Mike Bossy, we were, we were talking about him in the Islanders and Con and he goes, Connor McDavid is the fastest human being I've ever seen in a pair of skates. And I said, I'm stealing that. That is the <laughs> best you know yeah identification of of Connor mcdavid because he does everything at lightning speed that nobody's ever been able to do um you know i, I saw Gilbert perot and gila Fli i mean they they excelled high speed stick handling you know deking players you know and that's hard to do you know you can you can stick handle fast and you can skate fast but try to do both of them at the same time and that's what Connor mcdavid does he he makes it look so easy even the fastest defenseman in the league look nervous when he's coming down on him. It's like, they're like, uh Oh, and they'll turn around and start skating forward just to get a, just to get a little <laughs> head start on him. And he still blows by him. So no, it, it, he's an impressive young man. And I, I, you know, we're, we're marveled at all these, the skills of these players at that speed. 
You made the playoffs. I think I may have misread this, but I think you made the playoffs every single season of your career except maybe one. One, yeah. How in the world are you walking around right now? Like, right? Like, is your body just crumbling, right? You you think about – you have no recovery for your entire career. You go all that way in the playoffs. Six Stanley Cup championships as a player. How did you recover from year to year? Well, you know, you, you, you let your body rest. You know your body will talk to you if you listen to it. And But, you know, when you have aches and pains, and we all did. It wasn't like I was Superman. Um, we all had aches and pains, you know, little tweaks, knees, you know, this, that, and another thing, and shoulders. I, I never felt like I was different or better than. Um, everybody had a brace. I had a knee brace. I had a couple knee braces. I had an elbow brace, one, one playoff, a shoulder harness, one playoff. And you do what you have to do in order to get there. And then you, you start rehabbing. You know, you start you know, building that muscle back and getting ready for the next season. Boom. Next thing you know, you're, you're feeling great. Um, but there is wear and tear. There's some arthritis and, and you deal with that, you know, a little at a leave. Right. And, you know, it, the, those are just a part of my day some days. And uh, I got a, I got a hip replacement in 2000. Uh, was it 17 already? Holy cow. A few years ago already, but it feels great. I mean, that's tech. Like I love modern medicine. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, like, but, you know, I golf, I don't do anything silly. I don't do anything stupid. I get a little cranky back once in a while, a little cranky this, but I think everybody who, who does some, not just hockey players, but athletes, there's probably bricklayers out there, bad backs, bad, mm-hmm. you know, arthritis in their hands or whatever, just from laying bricks every day. So there's, uh, I think it's called osteoarthritis and it's just wear and tear in the body. And, you know, cowboys and you know, their backs and their knees and their hips, uh, same thing. It's just, it's just wear and tear. And I think all of us who, but when you're giving your all and you're loving to do something, it's, it's a price you pay, but it's love. It's just pure love. And no one, no one's complaining. I don't complain every day. I don't get up in the morning. Oh man, I wish I wouldn't have played hockey for 18 years and coached for another 10 and flew on planes and, you know, sleep in a different bed every now and then. Like, oh my God, I'm the luckiest guy in the world to play 18 years. Coach for the woo woo. Better play in a different bed every night. Wow. You know, like that's the fun of it. God, enjoy it, embrace it, love it. That's, that's awesome, such a good man. attitude. It's, it's the only attitude you we can all have. Do that. I'm, right. not, I'm not any different than a whole bunch of other guys. Paul Coffey and I talked about it. We're arch rivals. He was in Edmonton Oilers. New York Islanders, and then we had up two teammates who went to Stanley Cup together here in in Pittsburgh. Roommates, believe it or not, we're sitting there giggling and laughing. Oh, the once mighty Oilers! Oh, those once mighty Islanders! And here we are now. Oh, those mighty Penguins! Oh, we're the pesky Penguins. Okay, we'll be the pesky Penguins. But you know, like it's really <laughs> fun to share those stories with, with with Paul because he feels the same way. Like we didn't think of it like, oh my God, this is a sacrifice or this is. This is dedication. This is pure joy, pure love, you know, passion with the new word. But I think all of those things are just great. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, I wouldn't trade it a second of any of that. We, 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 a little cranky back. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's just amazing <laughs> because, like, you, you hear, like, LeBron James will sometimes be like, oh, like, no one understands the wear and tear of, like, going to the championship every single year because you have no offseason. These other guys are finished two, three months before you. So it really has always just been in the back of my mind, like, that Islander team being able to do that four times in a row, you being able to do it six times. It's just – it's something I can't even fathom, just the wear and tear. And it was a different game, too. You guys – you know, those refs weren't as lenient to call penalties back then as they are now. I mean, you guys, I, I sit back and watch YouTube videos because I wish I was alive. Trust me. I wish I was alive during the 80s. But fucking man, you guys were taking slashes every five seconds, getting thrown into the boards. It was not an easy game. No, there's head hunting. There's all kinds of fun, fun stuff going on. But, you know, it's, I always took the idea it's better to give than receive. And you're kind mm-hmm. of the Christian attitude about everything. But, you know, like I think like I never hit Guy Lafleur. I never hit you know, I bumped him, but I never hit him, you know, like even Wayne, I bumped him, but I never hit him like Mario. Um, The purest, you know, you play hockey, I'm playing hockey, but if a guy wants to get like ugly and play a little nasty, I'll play a little nasty with you. Not a big deal. I'm not going to like drop my gloves and beat you up, but I'll, I'll sting you somehow. But I think over that, over time, you gain respect, you gain a certain amount of like, okay, he he might burn me over here if I, if I rock him a little bit, but guys, are guys are, um, it's a war. It's a war out there, and I, I love that war. I love that that battle. Uh, I miss it. Um, you know, to fight through checks or fight through a hook or be able to do accomplish what we did at that against that kind of hockey was was spectacular. And every one of us look back and go, "Man, that was awesome." But we'd all like to play in today's. There's a, maybe a little less battle, 
there's still wear and tear, but that wear and tear of like, you know, the battle, battle, battle in the corners, battle, battle, battle in front of the net, you know, the battle, battle, battles of looking over your shoulder and not getting head hunted. You know, Mike Bossy's, we just chuckled to ourselves like, heads up, duck, <laughs> watch out. <laughs> we were like, eyes behind the back, here. but we were each other's eyes and we kind of like, we all protected each other, you know, if somebody like, and it was, it was, it was great. Like we had big Clark Gillies on the left side, the big brother who was, nobody touched us and yeah. somebody did and he come and he was angry i think he got madder if they beat they hit us than he did if they hit him. <laughs> and we love that about him we have we have such love for the big boy but he is uh he's a you don't you don't have the kind of success you you have without having that kind of caring about each other you know and and i think uh, you know, Clark knew his role. I knew my role. Mike knew his role. And we, I, Mike never put Clark in a position, you know, to, oh, protect my butt. You know, it was always somebody taking taking a run at him. And Clark, you, we all know what, what a run at somebody is and what, what it isn't. If somebody hit Mike and it was clean, no big deal. But if someone took a run at him, uh-oh. Our whole team got angry. I remember Bobby <laughs> jumped over the boards one time. Ben Wilson was was uh, was up against, and Clark was in the penalty box. And over the boards come Bobby Nystrom. So the whole team, you know, Billy Smith, out of the net. Don't pick on Mike Boss. And then <laughs> it was just really kind of fun to have that kind of the team concept at that time. You know, you do it nowadays. I think everybody does it to a degree, but not to the degree that we did it back in the 70s and 80s. Who's the toughest bastard you ever played against? If you had the number one, with, with the toughest, strongest, yes, that I ever faced on defense, Larry Robinson. Like Larry Robinson, Montreal Canadiens, six foot. He looked like six foot ten, but he's probably six foot four, six foot five. You know, two hundred and twenty pounds, and just really lean. A gentleman, but tough. <sighs> And if you want to get nasty and mean, oh, I'll get mean. And he was as tough as anybody in the league. And I, we, we had great respect for Larry, but Larry would take me out and literally lift me off the ice, like grab me by the armpits, lift me off the ice. So your legs are dangling in the air and then bang me against the glass. So I'm pressed against the glass. I imagine the people on, uh, that are watching my face, you know, like smeared against the glass are laughing. Like, oh, that poor kid. And then, <laughs> gently let me down or drop me and, uh, and then pick me up and say, you okay, little guy? <laughs> That's aggravating. That's aggravating when you're a little guy and he's a monster. You can't do anything about it. And, you know, I try to get a little bump on him. is like, you know, a flea hitting an elephant. And he just kind of like, what are you trying to do to me there, little guy? And I'm like, I'm payback, you know, but it, it didn't, it didn't work. He was tough to play against long reach, you know, poke check. You had to go around and try to get around him and just a real gentleman on the ice, you know, like, don't don't play dirty i'll play clean but he didn't know how strong he was and a couple of times or the well the couple seemed like every time he took it was just like you're going nowhere and you know if i want to really hurt you i could um you know larry was larry was my toughest my toughest opponent probably face to face center ice daryl sittler 60 minute game yeah. mark sa had a little nasty t nastiness to him a lot of respect for for Mark. There there were some players you know you love playing against, whether it's Mario Lemieux. You know the purists were really fun. Gilbert Perot, the guys that were like stick handling genius, they were a challenge. But you know I really enjoyed that Marcel Dion. Like there there's some great players that I played against that I got great respect for. Coming in to the league, Stan Mikita, first face off, I win the draw and I'm like, all right, I beat Stan Mikita on face off. All of a sudden it's like Zorro in my face. You know he's like, you know like he almost. I think, Jacques Lemaire cut me for like six stitches after a face off one time. I'm taking every face off after and I'm, I'm like at the end of my <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> lesson learned. We, yeah. we talked to a lot of golfers um, that have grown up playing professional golf in the Tiger Woods era. And we always ask like, you know, like, do you think of Tiger Woods differently being a player and, a, and an opponent or do you have the same respect for him as the fans do right like we all t t think of tiger woods as the greatest so with gretzky being on the ice with them at the same time like did you guys as players like have the same respect at this at at the time as the fans did like did you guys notice what was going on at the at like in real time yeah w wayne was wayne was trip hockey player like he was a stealth like he was hard guy to find on the ice and keep your eye on because he was just always finding holes making himself available and then putting pucks to holes and, and finding players that, you know, very instinctively and very creative um, genius, like in that sense, you know, 
we were we, we we didn't marvel them we respected them but we didn't marvel them you marveled them too much you're sitting there and you become a fan right and uh you know you watch them versus playing against them you want to compete hard against them you know wayne wayne's a special kid like you know whole, like he's only five years younger than me but <laughs> we, we thought of him at the time like he's 19 20 21 years old and we're like 25 26 years old big deal and like we're saying wow what what, what is what skill what what an amazing you know numbers he's putting up for just not a big man but you know a, a slinky little you know skilled athletic stinker who like just got things done with his little arms his little legs and boom he was uh he's a terrific terrific and he, what an ambassador for the game like you talk about great ambassadors of the game you know gordy house and jean belliver like Wayne took it on his shoulders and he, you know, he always said the greatest things about his teammates, respect for the opposition, the game of hockey. And uh, so I hold Wayne way up there and I loved his dad. You know, Walter to me was like, you know, Walter, if he was walking on one side of the street and I was on the other side, he wouldn't wave to you. He'd trot across the street and come and visit with you. Wow. And, and I love that about Walter because he would, he would tell me stories about not Wayne, but his family. And uh, so that that to me was Walter, and I think Wayne carries that Walter in him a lot because he, you know, I've I've had a chance to like do a couple All Star games or, or some some events with Wayne, and he loves to laugh. He's a great team oriented guy, you know. As great as his individual skills are, Walter was always so proud that his assists were like double what his goal scoring was, because he was always spreading the wealth. You know, he had that capability of like you know, making everybody around him that much better. So yeah, no, the great players, we have great respect for the Mario Lemieux, you know, obviously like there's just so many Bobby. When I was a kid, I wanted to be Bobby Orr. I was a defenseman. I wanted to be, I was too small to be Bobby Orr. I, was, I wanted to be Jean Beliveau. I was too short to be Jean Beliveau, you know, and all of a sudden I play with Mario Lemieux and he becomes my Jean Beliveau. Okay, here's this guy who's graceful and sleek and, and just, you know, just, carries himself with grace on the ice. I'm like, oh man, I wish I could do that. You know, but that's, we, 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 we want to be something and we, we strive to be that, but we have such great respect for those that can do and those that achieve, you know, looking like that. And, um, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of dynamic to me. I just wanted to win. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell my kids and I tell, you know, students when I go to schools, I'm like, you know, like you, you can YouTube me. I might get a sneaky little goal here and there, but there was nothing dynamic. I didn't stick handle through six players, you know, and falling down, you know, <laughs> over the shoulder shot, went over the goalies, but it was, it was just kind of like, oh, a little chink shot that kind of found a hole. And I did that a lot and uh, found ways to help my team win. And that's all I wanted to do. And I think for that, I think I've gotten a little respect over the years as far as like, you know, just achieving my own little respect niche of respectability amongst some oh of the, yeah the NHL greats you deserve it man we've rattled off those stats before but i mean it's the my boys my boys 1353 points are you kidding me i mean that's nothing to sneeze at as the kids say nowadays so after a long day on the course did we just does anybody guess that we just had one of those can anyone tell a long they can probably tell long day Dude, on the course. trent's got his shoes off right now <laughs> he's been and we're really, standing he's been doubling over you know it's a, you know stands. it's a long day when i just can't stand still <laughs> I, I you know what i mean yeah because your legs are like dude we're, we're just trying to sit right you just if you stop moving you're gonna fall right. you ever look around especially with this job and just be like how the fuck where are we right now yeah i've all thought about that, that all, all day today dude i'm like looking around and i see these like these silhouette dark ass fucking really high Tory pine trees and all these cypress trees. And I'm like, are we recording a podcast standing around with Trent and his shoes off at Tory pines in like San Diego, California? It's crazy. Like we're just flying tomorrow home back to New York. What's happening right now? Where's what are mood? we talking about? Where's the mood at? Well, uh, you know what you really need after a long day like that? It was a long day after that? Is, uh, is you got to get a healthy meal in you. You got to get oh some food. God. We're all talking about that right oh. now. Is this trifecta? This is trifecta. Dude, oh, I'm, I am a, so I'm on the trifecta train. Is that something that they talk about? You know what, they the should because it's a little alliteration. I am on, on the trifecta thing. train. I get home. It's busy. It's been a busy day. I was out there golfing, doing a little G with my pal Trent. I come home. 
uh, you know, I, I don't want to cook. No one around me wants to cook. It's already there. It's cooked. It's fresh. It's healthy. It's It's got none of the bad stuff that you would end up putting in it. Takes it. just a few minutes to whip a, up, right? You throw it. You either throw it in a pan if you want to sear it, or you throw it in the microwave. There's two different options. It comes out so good, so tasty, so healthy. You're in, you're out. You throw it in the garbage, you're done. With the little pan, and it's low cows. Low cows. Like under 500 cows. Low Every sodium, low cows, low sugar, really all the good. things. It's right. really good. Meal prep that elite athletes use. It's more than just food. It's a nutrition program. Trifecta has an app to help track your meals and fitness. A community for Trifecta customers to support progress. And, of course, what you like the most about your Trifecta meals, which is obviously how healthy and delicious they are. Chefs. they got all kinds of good chefs in there that are whipping up these meals. And you guys get 40% off. If you shop meal plans, you will get 40% off with code 4. You go to trifectanutrition.com slash 4. Use the code 4, and you will get 40% off. Again, wow. I don't know how they're making money with that. But is this a, is this a non-profit organization? Delivering <laughs> food? This is just off? like, what, do we have to have a conversation with Trifecta on like, how do they like, run their business Not plan? sure like, where their math is, but it's good for you guys. I would love to sit down at a, at a table with these guys. Shop meal plans and get 40% off with code 4 at trifectanutrition.com slash 4. <laughs> 40% off? <laughs> Dude, and they ship it in like, fro like freezer containers and shit. Right, that's expensive. It's so expensive. Expensive. You, we mentioned golf a little bit. This is a golf podcast. How's the game? You, you get out and play a lot, or I play golf like the Sutter family plays hockey. I <laughs> slash and whack. I just love to. <laughs> I love to just slash the ball and whack the ball. And I tease. I tease my my Sutter family because they're such good friends, and they they look at me like. And I've seen them play golf, and they play worse golf than me. <laughs> but when I say that about their hockey, they're they're they were competitive. But uh, no, I can, I, I, I probably a 15 to an eight on a really good day. I can be a 12. If they move the tees up, I can be a 10. There you go. I play the back tees. I'm a 25. Mm -hmm. I played with uh, Pierre LaRouche and Mary Lemieux and they're like scratch golfers and they laugh because they play the tips and I can't get over the trouble to get to the fairway on the other side. <laughs> so I kind of try to keep it in play. And when I try to swing hard, it, the, I don't know where the ball's going. It might be a worm burner. It might be a duck hook. It might be. A banana and you can buy my ball and uh, they just just drop one on the other side they just chuckle and i'm like next you know i'm on i'm by the green i chip close one putt and we have the hole and they're like we hate you yeah, right. <laughs> so, like i can i can par a hole that way or i can bogey get a shot and part and, and and have the hole so and it, it is fun but um no i really enjoy the game i i'm kind of a co contact hitter when it comes to the game of golf i try to hit the ball on the face of the, the club, try to keep it in play, and I don't try to overswing. Um, I, and the fortunate thing is I'm so jealous of the guys that are righty in hockey and righty in golf. So I'm a lefty in hockey, and then I'm, I can only play righty golf. I try really? to play lefty golf. I can't even putt lefty. I don't even come close to the huh. pole lefty. And I putt righty, and I'm kind of around the hole at least, <laughs> give myself a chance. And so I'm a little bit jealous of the righty righty guys versus me, the lefty righty guy in golf but i have a blast playing with my buds we have a great time they chuckle at me you know because i played with a guy he was a scratch golfer and i was 19 20 years old i'm playing i, I play with bob hope i play with some celebrities you know that were really oh. good golfers when i was 19 20 years old and you know i'm kind of the hockey celebrity playing with a real you know movie star celebrity and 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 they're entertaining and i'm just sweating bullets just trying to keep not kill anybody who's like looking in the fairway watching brian trache swing the club I play with a guy, his name was Warren Amendola. He taught me a lot about golf. I played him two or three times. He gave me the, you know, the bullet points of golf, you know, head down, you know, swing through the ball. Don't try to lift it up. All those basics, you know, I needed to hear when I was beginning. And he was like a, a member at the Huntington Crescent Club. And he, he said, I think I shot 130 that day. And I was so proud because I think I had like four great shots all day. And he was just so encouraging all day. And he goes, at the end of it, he goes, Brian, I want to thank you. I've been a member at this golf course for 23 years, and I've seen parts of this golf course I've never seen. <laughs> Took him on the tour. Yeah. I think there's alligators <laughs> over there. I, <laughs> I, the, yeah. I don't know. There's not alligators over there. But, um, you know, but it's a fun game, isn't it? It's really, it's a it's a time to bond. It's a time to, to tease each other at the same time. You know, guy hits a shot, everybody celebrates. I love I love that your golf game equates to your uh, hockey game a little bit, where you, you you kind of scramble get the ball in the hole, like you're saying. You used to look for just the holes in the goalie, just throw it at the net and see see if it goes in. 
something good will happen. I saw Kenny Moore, where we we're, we're playing Dakota Dunes in Saskatoon, we're at a training camp for the Islanders. So five or six of us veteran Islanders come up there, you know, and, and we get to hang out with them for a week. And it's really fun because we can play golf during the day, go to the hockey hockey rink and watch the kids play and eat dinner with them. And, and we couldn't thank the Islanders enough because it's really an opportunity to blend and kind of share some of our experiences with some of the new Islanders and uh, to crisscross, you know, you know, Islander basically legends with the young kids coming up. It was really a great opportunity. So we all go out, we're playing a five. So there's uh, Kenny Morrow, myself, Butch Goring, Clark Gillies, Bobby Nystrom. And we all we're playing a par three and it's like 165 yards. And, you know, Clark Gillies hits a, a wedge. I hit like a five wood. <laughs> Kenny Morrow hits like this five iron and it does like this one hop and Butch Goring's looking through his binoculars. He goes, I think it has a chance and like three hops into the hole for a whole No, one. no. Oh yeah. So Kenny Morrow's won four Stanley Cups, a gold medal. Yeah, his four oh, years. I, I've talked about he, he had the best four years in the history of professional sports. He won the Miracle 1980 team, went out to win four straight cups immediately. The guy didn't know anything but losing. I know he's got grand. He got grandkids. He's got two beautiful daughters, a son, and and I'm, I'm and I've never seen him so excited. Oh, <laughs> a bad knee. He's hopping around. Ooh, ooh. I said, Kenny, be careful that knee. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Like he's out of hole in one will do that to you. See, you Holy celebrate smokes. like you've never celebrated before. Wow, oh, man, that's a guy who needs more respect in in today's. You know, when we think back to Islander hockey players and 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 the greats, Ken Morrow, I think is uh, I've met Ken a couple times, and he couldn't be a nicer guy. And and when you watch back all those great plays, you, like the Trottiers to the Nystroms, Ken was right there with you guys, and he was he was such an, an integral part of your guys championship core dynasty well we called i called him the long arm of the law like he's a yank like we called him like there was a couple yankees on the team and it was really kind of fun to have kenny back there because he's so unassuming you can't get under his skin you can't like tease him you know like he was the wolf man because he like had a hair all over his body and he was just <laughs> like this this happy guy who was just unassuming but he was quicker than people thought he was stronger than people thought he was more skilled than people thought, and he always made the simple play look, you know, unspectacular. But it was the smartest play, and we loved him because of that. And so we like, and Kenny's just that guy that just wants to be a part of something great. And uh, you know, we know why he was part of that miracle on ice now because he was back there, dependable, um, you know, poised, you know, never never rattled, you know, take a hit to make a play, you know, make the simple play versus the, 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 the dramatic play. And, you know, he was capable of scoring the big goals. He scored some big goals for us, you know, in key times, you know, that kind of either yep. won the game in overtime or sealed the game when they pulled their goalie guys hanging all great, but all right, Kenny with a <laughs> bad knee going down the ice. <laughs> I got it. Tapping the puck. His arms are so long. Tapping the puck ahead of somebody and then flipping it. We're all like, ooh, is the puck going to make it over the over the line? You know, he's like, and everybody's racing for it to see if he just slides in. Just <laughs> That's so Kenny. And like, uh, so when we won the cup the first time, I Bobby Nystrom scores, you know, and it's mayhem. Yep. Overtime, Long Island, the place going crazy. I'm going to cry. Everybody jumps over the board. I'm exhausted. That moment, you're a champion. Exhaustion hit me like, like a brick. So I go to jump over the boards, and my foot hits the top of the boards. I trip, and I tumble, fall. And who's picking me up is Kenny Moore. Oh, man. I, and, and Kenny's got like, we won the cup. I'm like, Kenny, I'm so tired. Like, I know, but we won the cup. I'm like, Kenny, your equipment stinks. Like, you know, your, <laughs> your senses peak, and you can yeah. finally smell the smell of equipment. I'm like, oh, my God, Kenny. But that's the fun of it. And I, we, you know, Kenny and I laugh about it today. He's like, Dad, do you remember that time you told me my equipment stinks right at the moment we went to the Stanley Cup? I'm like, yes, I remember. It was still, it's a vivid smell in my nose. Right. But, uh, you know, like Kenny's, Ken, uh, Kenny and I shared a lot of fun times together. God, he's a terrific human being. So that first cup win is included in your NFT collection. First cup win, four in a row is another one. Um, everyone's got to head to briantrottier.com. You can check all those out. I will be probably the highest bidder on all of them after talking to you today. 
I mean, uh, it's been an honor. It's been a pleasure. Um, I hope to catch an Islander game with you one of these days. How, how, how do you feel about this team this year? I mean, it's got to be – I, I know we've ha had you for long enough, but um, it's got to feel good seeing that the franchise has turned around a little bit. There were some dark days when I was – you know, I've gone to every single game I can remember, and I've seen some dark Islander days. So it's been fun to watch this team. How do you feel about it? Well, before we close, we want to thank your family for being a part of our history. I mean, it's really fun, fun times that um, we got a chance to share with your family. But all, you know, for me, the Islanders today, Matt Barzell, you look at their goaltending, you look at the coaching, you look at Lou Lamorello, what he's done in the culture. Uh, you look at what, what they have looked forward to with Belmont. You look at their back at Nassau Coliseum and the, the, the crazes. It, 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 it's crazy. I mean, I'm just like the atmosphere there. So they got a taste of that. And I think that helped. All those things helped. And uh, so we're really proud. They're a scrappy team. You know, they got four lines that come at you. They're, they never give up. So, yeah, they're going to be – I think they're a team that's going to be reckoned with. And, uh, you know, my other pesky little penguins are right there again. There you go. You, know, you got those Colorado Avalanche and McKinnon out there. There's some There's some teams that I pulled for because I was part of their organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, yeah, no, my Islanders, I'm, I'm very, very proud. People say, oh, and the Islanders play the penguins. Who do you play for, pull for? I'm like, the home team. I want the fans <laughs> to go home happy. You know, I want the fans to say, be cheering their lips. And it gives me a, a sense of being, you know, a little diplomatic. But it's true. I pull for the fans. I pull for the home team because win or lose, you know, I'm going to go home winner because right. I, I'm kind of pulling for both teams. I'm pulling for a great game. I don't want to blow out one way or another. I'd like to see Crosby get a hat trick, Barzell get a hat trick, the fans be happy, goaltenders, you know, too bad for you. You don't get shut out. But <laughs> at the same time, there's that that thrill of hockey, you know, like the the intensity, the competition, all that fun stuff that people enjoy that when they go, the fans go to see the game, they want to see excitement. And I, my little Islanders and Penguins right now are, are, are not leaving that, that glass half full. It's a full cup when people go home. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you again, uh, Brian. It's been uh, about 50 minutes here, so I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, it's been a highlight of my career. There's, there's no doubt about it. When you're having fun, 50 minutes goes by in a snap. That's right. Thanks, guys. That, was, that was great fun. Hey, continue successes, guy. Um, look forward to being a guest anytime. Like I said, thank you. all it takes is an invite. Thank, thank you. Thank oh, you so you, much. You're gonna, you're gonna wish you never said that because we're gonna be. We're, you're gonna be. You may just be the next host of the show. <laughs> <laughs> thank <laughs> you so much. All right. Thank okay, you, Brian. All the best. Thanks.